So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for joining today, Tanya in Real Life. We are continuing Baruch Hashem, Tanya, Parakid Bay's chapter 12. This is part three of Parakid Bay's, and it's part three of four, Emir Tashem. Um, we're still not done. I want to dedicate today's learning to a very dear friend, Gila Rachel Bas Esther, who, um, who's part of our group. She's been on almost every week since we started. And, um, and last week she wasn't feeling well with COVID and today she's really needs our tefillah. So Gila Rachel Bas Esther should have a refuah shalema, complete recovery, complete healing um, in a way that's Hashem's way of healing, like Chaydash Iyar, Ni Hashem, Reifecha, like even better than before this um, illness struck. And uh, we should hear only good news very soon from her, from all of us and from all of Kali Yisrael. So Gila Rachel Bas Esther. Okay, what is a Bainani? We're gonna do a little bit of a review before we jump into the text. And that's why we're not gonna do that much of the actual text, okay? <laughs> You'll forgive me. But I know for myself that it took me time to like refresh and jump, get into the, into the, into the mode of where, we're, where we were up to, get into that flow, that train of thought. So we were talking about a Bainini. What is a Bainini? A Bainini is somebody who on the inside, both the Nefesh and the ha both the Nefesh and Bahamas and the Neshama have active fights. They're both equally fighting for control of the small city, the, the mind, the heart, and the behaviors. But the Neshama wins the fight all the time, everywhere. The Neshama is the one that actually gets to show up in the conscious choices of the Bainini. A Bainini gets triggered into ego um, and a mindset of by myself, with myself, for myself, but in the way the Bainini shows up in action and even in the conscious thinking, a Bainini chooses um, the mindset of and the behavior that's aligned with by Hashem, with Hashem, for Hashem. And before we continue talking about how to be a Bainini, I wanna just refresh our memory about what we were discuss what we were discussing in terms of how a Bainini makes us like what is a Bainini in terms of emotional wellness? And the reason why I want to bring this back to the forefront of our consciousness is because I feel like we're not just spiritual people. We're emotional people, we're psychological people, we're physical people. And we cannot separate our emotions from our spirituality or from our physicality. And um, the language that the Tanya uses might be spiritual, but it equally directly applies to our emotional wellness. So let's talk about it a little bit so that we, we can, we can we, so that when we talk about the language, when we read the text of the Tanya, we have the bigger picture that includes also our emotional wellness. Okay, so we know all of us, every single one of us, each of us gets pulled into toxicity. We have all kinds of unhealthy, self-destructive thoughts. We have unhealthy moods. We have self-destructive habits, um, destructive habits, all kinds of, of um, thought patterns, behavior patterns. And really the truth is that on their own, none of our beliefs or behaviors are destructive. The only time a behavior or a thought becomes destructive is when we're limited by it, when we feel like there's no other place to be, when we have nowhere else to go in our minds or in our hearts, when we cannot move out of our anxiety or our depressing mood or our worthlessness, because if I think it, this is how it is. If this is how I feel, this is how it is. And this is the only way it is. It's not having the bad mood that's the problem. It's being stuck in it. It's not, and, and the mood itself is obviously, you know, we all get into it. Um, it's the worthlessness, the worthlessness, the idea of having, a, of, of being worthless, it's not our problem, right? It's when we're, when we really feel stuck with, by that worthlessness, when we can't get out of it, that's when it becomes a problem. So we, and, and, and sometimes I'm sure you can all relate to this. I know that for me, I, I definitely, you know, when I, when I, in my, olden days when I would feel worthless, when I had the sense of worthlessness, no matter who told me or what author, what book I read that described every person's value, it didn't mean anything because 
my perspective, my feeling about this is always going to be more true for me than what other people might say, right? You'll tell me I'm good enough, but I know the truth. In my bones, I know the truth. My gut knows the truth and I'm not good enough. And you cannot convince me. You can't convince me. I trust myself more than I trust you. Now, of course, we should trust our own opinions more than we trust other people's opinions. It would be dangerous to surrender our opinions, our minds to another human being, right? If you see that the sky is blue and someone tries to convince you that it's pink, of course, it would be unhealthy to act as if it's pink, to negate what you believe, what you see with your own mind, with your own eyes and, and, and act as if it's pink because someone else said, what do you mean? I see that it's blue. Why should I negate or reject what you say or reject what I think because someone else thinks differently, right? So in a certain sense, that's, that's a healthy way of behaving. That's a healthy way of, of, you know, of processing our thoughts. And yet, and yet, sometimes the sky actually is pink and orange and all kinds of glorious colors. And if we can never see those colors, if it's always only blue, we're really missing out in life. We're so limited. And, and obviously I'm using the sky as an analogy. Let's bring it down to our worthlessness and our worthiness, right? If I see myself as, as worthless, less than other people, not good enough, I'm compromised. I am damaged goods, okay? Why should I believe you when you tell me that I'm wonderful? Why should I believe that I'm gorgeous when you tell when I that I when I know that that I'm ugly, that this is that 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 I'm nothing, right? If I'm anxious about tomorrow, if I'm insecure, if I'm afraid of the night, if I have this habit at screaming at my kids or getting resentful or feeling helpless or feeling really sorry for myself, why should I not listen to my heart? Why shouldn't I say what I feel and think what I feel? This is where I am. This is who I am. And there's a little bit of truth to this, right? Because it is indeed dangerous to surrender to another human being, to accept as truth something that you don't really believe is true. Why would you do that? That's not how Hashem gave us brains and minds and hearts and bodies for a reason. And we dare not you know, negate our, our sensitivity to our, our sense of what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what's beautiful and what's ugly. And, and this, tr the fact that this is truth makes it so complicated and so complex because nobody's life was ever ruined because of an unhealthy habit. Nobody's marriage was ever destroyed. Nobody's marriage ever fell apart because of trauma or toxicity or even because of abusive behavior. That's not what destroys a marriage. That's not what destroys a life. That's not what destroys our sense of sanity and inner peace. What destroys us is when we are stuck within that viciousness and we cannot get out. We cannot set ourselves free. We, and when can't we get out? We can't, we can't get out because this is who I am. What do you mean? This is who I am. I could run away to China. I could run away to the Australia, but Australia is not far enough. I can't run away from myself. So there's really only, and from that perspective, when we consider that this is such a huge obstacle to becoming free of our limiting be beliefs and our destructive behaviors, there's really only one healing force in our lives, and that is Hashem. Hashem is MS, Hashem is absolute truth, a truth that, could, that we could rely on, a truth that we could set our clocks by. It's not just the truth, it's a North Star, a truth we could center our lives around. And the way we save ourselves, the way we can heal from anything, from any belief, from any destructive behavior is when we're willing to say, okay, if Hashem says it's pink, then even though it looks to me like blue, but I will accept that. I will go with that. I will act on it. Because if Hashem says it's pink, it's pink. If Hashem says it, then that's what it is. And I want to just share something that happened that, that someone shared with me last night. Last night, we had the in-person um, Power Up series. Mirza Hashem, one day we will bring it to Zoom. But someone came over to me 
and and she shared that she heard something in this Tanya discussion that made such a big difference in her life. She said, I had such a sense of worthlessness and it was so liberating to hear that Hashem loves me. And from the way she was talking, it seemed to me that she really took that in and she accepted it. She made room for that, for Hashem's love in her heart. It made a difference. It made a dent, at least a dent, if not a very big difference, an opening in her heart. She was practically in tears as she, almost in tears, as, as, as she was describing the magnitude of the impact that this message had on her. And really, it's to her credit, because the only way that I could let Hashem's love mean something to me and make a big difference to me is if, if Hashem's existence and Hashem's truth and Hashem's value makes that kind of difference to me. So that's really what we're talking about here. If I can say the fact that Hashem says it means it's true in a way that overrides my other truth, the truth that I thought was really true, that saves us because then we're surrendering to a truth that we could rely on, a truth that is always going to be healthy and good for us, as opposed to, you know, why should I surrender to another human being? So really Hashem is our, um, you know, Hashem is our healing force. If Hashem says I am worth worthy, then I know in my gut that I'm actually worthless. And this is really something that I experienced also. It was like, oh, Okay, and for the first time, I, I, I had read a lot of books before, uh, before you know, really studying Tanya and allow, opening my heart to allow the Baal Tanya's teachings to make a real penetrating difference in my heart, in my life, in my beliefs. And, and, and it was only when I really valued Hashem from a deep place inside of me in a way that I could look at myself with curiosity and say, oh, hey, you know, the sky is pink. I wonder what's making me unable to see that. Or I am worthy. I must be worthy. So let me see what's getting in the way of my feeling that. Let me get rid of that. Let me let go of it. Let me, you know, hold on to the truth. When you believe that something is true, it, it, it's, 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 it becomes the force that cancels out anything that negates it or denies it or ignores it. And so that's the bottom line. The one main, main ingredient um, of all our emotional health is when we trust Hashem's truth more than we trust our own selves, right? Because if we only trust ourselves, we have limit, all of us have limiting beliefs. We all have traumatic experiences that impact our beliefs. We all have, you know, um, we, in our childhood, in our past, in our circumstances, in our situations, by nature, by nurture, we have limiting beliefs and self-destructive behaviors, even thought patterns that just, we would, if we never got, got out of ourselves, we would always be stuck within our toxicity and our brokenness and our detachment from our worthiness, from our capability, from our beautifulness, if that's a word, right? If I'm a beautiful person, but I think I'm ugly, I will be stuck in my, in my sense of ugliness. If I'm, uh, if I have, if I'm attached to my abusive, toxic habits, then, you know, because, and I think that that's who I am, that's who I will always be. I'll always be stuck there. So, and, and to let a person takes me out means that I'm still stuck because now instead of being stuck within me, I'm stuck within that other person, right? The only true freedom and the only true healing comes when we trust Hashem even more than we trust our conscious selves. And we let Hashem's truth and Hashem's will be our deeper, bigger, conscious truth. Because then we could say, look, I feel worthless. I feel totally like a nothing, like a piece of dust. I feel really like ugly, okay? And that feeling is so real, it's in my bones, it's in every inch of my blood, it's in my body, and, or, or this habit, this habit that I have, it feels so compelling, it feels like I am going to do it, it just happens to me, it takes over my system, it's who I am, I've never been a different person, this is who I've always been, it's been my reality since I could remember, but then we're like, oh, but Hashem says I matter to him, 
right? Oh, okay, so that must be true, right? Or Hashem says, I could choose my behavior. Oh, okay, so then that means I'm not limited by my past and I'm not limited by whatever, you know, my compulsion. I don't feel that way, but I will try to take it in. I will, I will reach for the truth because it's true. And when you have, truth has that power. Truth has a certain sense of certainty. I'll never forget, and I may have shared this once, but I, I have this just coming up for me. I remember when one of my children, uh, my youngest is seven years old, but I think when she was a baby one time, um, she had a pacifier that she liked to sleep with at, in her mouth at night. And one time I had put her to sleep and then she woke up in the middle of the night and I wanted to, you know, I tried to comfort her and put her back to sleep, but I could not find her pacifier. And I was looking all over for it and I could not find it. But I thought, hey, she went to sleep with it. It Pacifiers do not walk away, you know? So I looked for it and eventually I found it. And I remember like being under her, under her crib, holding on to that pacifier with my right hand. And the first thought that came to my mind was like, wow, you look differently when you know for certain that it is there. You search differently. Your search has a different quality when you have a certainty, a sense of certainty that you will find it because it is there. So when, idea, when an idea is true and I know it's true, it gives a certain sense of certainty and now it's just a matter of how am I going to, like, where, where else can I look to be able to hold on to that? What is getting in my way? Truth has that power. So a Bainani, going back to the beginning of this discussion, a Bainani is someone who is absolutely aligned with Hashem. We get pulled into our ego. We get pulled into our otherness. We get pulled into all kinds of, you know, different ideas that contradict or deny Hashem's truth. But in terms of behavior, we always come back to bitter. We always come back to trusting Hashem. And I'm going to use the word obeying Hashem, yielding to Hashem's will and to Hashem's truth in a way that overrides and cancels out even our own version of reality, whatever our version of reality might be, no matter who told us otherwise. Ego says, I am here by myself, with myself, for myself, and I obey myself. If this is what I think, this is how I feel, this is what I do, this is how reality is, okay? And the Benini says, yes, I have that ego alive inside of me, but I don't lim limit myself to myself. I am here by Hashem, with Hashem, for Hashem, and I set my agenda according to Hashem's truth, not according to anything else. I let Hashem's truth override my perspectives, my desires, my compulsions, my, even everything, even my dreams. I let Hashem's truth really comfort me, really make a difference to me, really matter to me. Why? Because it's the truth. Okay, so I just wanted to establish that again as we talk about the Bainini again, because in the language of the Tanya, the Bainini is someone who never does the opposite of mitzvahs, who never digresses, never moves away from Hashem's will, absolutely aligned with Hashem in all times, in all places, in all, in all behaviors. And that's one layer of understanding who the Bainini is, but the same work also directly holds true and has that same impact on our emotional wellness because our emotional wellness is not separate from our Avaita Sashem. A Bainini is also an emotionally healthy person. Our conscious attachment to Hashem with Hashem doesn't just give us our spiritual wellness, it also gives us our physical, emotional, and psychological well-being. Okay, so how do we get there? How do we get there? Let's review the strategies that we learned so far. First of all, we talked about investing energy in choosing our behaviors and not losing energy on not choosing the struggle and not having the choice of the struggle. We have to recognize that there's a difference between our impulses and behaviors. And the Baal Tanya draws a very, very strong line between our impulses and our behavior. And it's so, so, so liberating because Hashem made us as we are. Hashem gave us the bodies that we have, the appearance that we have, the situation. And really, Hashem is ultimately responsible for every single thing that happened to us in our lives up until this very moment. 
everything that happened is exactly as Hashem wanted it to happen, exactly as Hashem designed it to be. So we need to make peace with it and not try to change it. We have to make peace with the fact that we will struggle with emotional darkness. The darkness will be there. The toxicity will be there. And it will be there because this is how Hashem designed it to be, designed us to be. We're human beings. Even if nothing, you know, even if we experience only minor traumas in our life, we're still human. And the trauma of just being alive, of not being conscious of our true self is already a just, that, that's already a fact and, and, and an impactful fact of just being human. So the fact that we're human means that we will experience unpleasantness. We will have darkness. We will have emotional um, struggle and chaos and confusion. And we have to make peace with that. We're not ugly because we have ugly thoughts. We are not a mess just because our insides are messy. And that's so, so liberating. I'll tell you why. Because when you notice that your inside is a mess, there's really only two choices. There's only two ways forward. Number one is we could spend our energy trying to change the impossible, trying to get rid of the mess, cancel it out. And that is a losing battle because it's impossible. Or we could change what is possible. And that is our, our behavior. You know, it's like if somebody's walking near an ocean. You could say, I hate the ocean. I wish it wouldn't be there. I want to walk on dry land. And you could spend the rest of your life trying to empty the ocean, you know, take out another cup and another cup and another cup. And it's a losing battle, obviously. Or we could decide, make peace that the ocean will be there. And if we want to walk on dry land, we could still walk on dry land. We could walk directly alongside that ocean. And in the analogy, um, which is my own analogy, so if it doesn't fit with you, it doesn't sit, it's, it's uh, just let it go. But in the analogy, you could hate the fact that you are the type of person who gets angry easily. You could hate the fact that you get depressed, that you feel anxious. You could hate the fact that you had a traumatic experience in your childhood. You could hate everyone and everything about yourself. You could hate all the people in your life, but you know, it that's not going to take it away. That's like, you know, trying to empty the ocean, another cup and another cup, one cup at a time. We could spend our whole lives fighting with ourselves or we could accept that the ocean will be there. We could accept that the darkness will be there. The chaos, the confusion, the sense of brokenness will still be there and we could walk alongside it and show up and do the right thing aligning ourselves with Hashem's truth and later on in Tanya the Baal Tanya tells us that eventually in this parak we don't talk about it in this chapter we don't talk about it but eventually our our inner self also does change but in the beginning as we begin this journey we're not even looking at trying to empty the ocean. We are not looking. Oh, I just realized an uh, uh, interesting thing with the analogy. You know, when B'nai Yisrael walked into the ocean, that is, you know, Hashem wanted us to walk in before he split the ocean. So I'm sorry for getting distracted. But what I'm trying to say is that e eventually, by focusing on our behavior and choosing our behaviors, instead of hating on our the existence of our struggle and the chaos and the darkness, eventually the darkness itself also dissip dissipates and, and um, it's weakened. But for now, as we begin the journey, we want to focus on our choices and, and, and who we are and what our struggles are is not part of our choices. That was number one, to invest energy in our choices rather than what is not our choice. The, number two was, Vilay Nikra love shame Russia. A, a Bainini is somebody who says, I will never be called a Russia. I will never be a person who conceals, denies, or ignores Hashem's truth. That's a Russia in the Balatanya's language, in the Balatanya's um, dictionary, right? A Russia is somebody who could conceal, deny, reject, contradict, or ignore Hashem's truth. A Bainini is someone who says, I will never do that. I'm never going to do that. And that's the first step in the process of change. It's changing the way we see ourselves. 
Okay. If it ignores or denies Hashem, I will give it zero credence in my life. The more credence we give to ideas that contradict or deny Hashem's truth, the more open we are to emotional unhealthiness. And the more, the less credence we give to ideas that contradict Hashem, the more emotionally healthy we can be. Number three was make your tefillah a time to do the very hard work of growing clarity about Hashem's truth. And with that clarity comes a commitment, the Ratzain, to live by that truth. And this is very profoundly impactful. We talked about that Mayach Shalat HaHalev. There's a principle of science that a behavior can only happen in our bodies when our mind gives ourselves permission to engage in that behavior. Mayach Shalat HaHalev means that the mind has dominant power over the heart. Even if a heart wants something very, very badly, very strongly, you're pulled in a certain direction, you can't move an inch, we can't move a toenail without our brain giving our, 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 our body permission to move that toenail. No matter how strongly we are drawn to a behavior, if there's no room in our mind for it, there will be no, there will no, there'll be no room in our behavior for it. So tefillah is the time when we develop clarity in our mind about who Hashem is. And with that clarity, we grow, um, we grow that commitment to stay true to Hashem's truth to give credence only to Hashem's truth and to become sensitive to ideas that, ha to see toxicity and emotionally unhealthiness as poison. And, and that happens by giving, you know, developing that clarity about who Hashem is and, and, and how great Hashem is and what our relationship with Hashem is. And the clarity prevents us from doing anything that ignores or contradicts Hashem. And number four is this doesn't say it directly in the Tanya, but the fact that you know we are given that the, the, the Baal Tanya tells us that we do have this choice. You know that a Benini could control their behavior. You can't control the struggle. We can't control the past. We can't control other people. We can't control what's going on even inside of us because that's part of the struggle, and that might have been you know part of our our, our wiring, our hard wiring. It's not something we could change, but what we could change is our behavior. So we really need to take 100% responsibility for every single one of our behaviors, everything we do, everything we think about, everything we, um, every, every idea that we entertain in our mind, our behavior is entirely our business and it's our only business. Now for behavior that happens without our permission, we're going to learn about that in chapter 13 in Merit Hashem. So now I want to continue in the text of the Tanya till here we did. Um, and I want to continue a little bit in the text of the Tanya and then we'll open up to discussion. We were talking about Mayach Shal Dal Halev, that um, the mind rules the heart. And that's why the davening, even though when a Benini closes the Siddur and walks away from davening, his heart is not aflame and it doesn't have that conscious commitment to Hashem, right? But still, the, 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 we have enough clarity to have made that commitment and that has a lasting impact on, on the rest of our day. So um, here the Baal Tanya tells us, okay, Every person has the capacity with the desire with the willpower of our mind to restrain, to hold back from our desires and to dominate over that spirit of temptation that's in our heart. And, and, and in two ways, number one, not to fulfill the desires of our heart in thought in speech and in action. And it's interesting here, the Baal Tanya says action first, because that's the most easy to, um, to take control over, right? That's like the first thing that we could do, whereas thought is the most subtle. So not to just go with whatever action we want to do or whatever word we want to say, or even idea that we want to entertain our mind. To completely turn around our mind, 
turn around the spotlight in our mind to focus on something else entirely. So each of us has that ability to hold back and to master the spirit of desires in our hearts. Number one, your desires are not your boss. It feels like it, right? It feels like when I have a desire, it feels like I must buy this. I must read this. I must see this. I must do this. I must say it, etc. right? We feel that our desires are compulsions, but really we should view them as a passing wind. It's very strong. It feels like, you know, you got to hold on tight when that wind blows. Sometimes you have to hold on to your shaitel, hold on to the, you know, hold on to, to the, to the scarf that you're wearing because the wind could blow it away. Sometimes you have to hold on to yourself and ground yourself more firmly in it, you know, where you're standing, like hold on because a wind is very strong. So a wind is very strong. Our desires are like winds, you know, they'll blow and they'll blow very, very strongly, but they are not orders that we must obey. They're not compulsions. They, we don't have to, they will pass. They will pass right by us. Okay. We don't have to act on our heart's desires, not in action, speech, and even in thought. And this is the order, right? Um, this is, this is what we, this, I, I feel like we maybe did talk about it. Honestly, I tried to listen to that the last time we spoke about Tanya to gain a hundred percent accuracy of where we're up to. I, I apologize if I'm repeating, but I didn't even remember. So I figured if I don't remember that I said it, maybe somebody else doesn't remember that they heard it. So that's, um, that's the thing of our desires and our wins. I want to just share a quick story about this. Um, that's a shtetl story. One time a person was passing, a man was walking down the street in the shtetl and he saw a group of children were screaming and cheering and, and, you know, and, and very wild and like really running around in circles and like, and, and what with the center of it all was a little goat who had ingested alcohol and was doing such like unusual behaviors for a goat, jumping really high and twisting and turning and rolling around. And the kids were hysterical with laughter. And this man is passing by and he didn't understand. He didn't see the goat right away. He's like, he asked the people, well, what's going on? What's, why is everybody, you know, so amazed and so alive and so like active around here? What's going on? So one of the children told him, pointed to the goat and see, so you see, the goat just jumped. So the guy mumbles under his breath and he's like, okay, so he jumped, you know, hotter gesprungen, hotter gelacht, you know? Um, and I love this story because, you know, there's a part of us that is like that child. What do you mean? She said, oh, he said that, you know, he was supposed to say that, or I really wanted that. Our desires and our instinctive reactions you know, we, we, we do like what those kids do. We get hysterical. We get like amazed at the, at the, we get swept up into that energy. But then there's, there's a part of us that could say, okay, so it's a wind. So the wind is blowing. So what? Stand strong and let the wind pass by. Let that desire move through your system. If you, if you let it move through your system, it will move. It's not going to stay because it's by nature, that's what it is. A wind doesn't stay in one place. A wind moves through. And um, it's interesting that the Baal Tanya calls um, that the Ruach Shtus, doing Averis, and it's also in Chazal, Ruach Shtus, a spirit, a folly. Ruach is, is the word for wind. It's like a, a wind. It's going to pass. If you don't, if you don't act on it, it will, it will move through you. It's okay. So he laughed. So he jumped. So he twisted. So he turned. Okay. We can let that emotion. So you feel hungry, so eat. But like, you know, so you feel upset. Okay, so you feel upset. So, so be upset. Let it pass. It's okay. You know, we don't get stuck. We don't, we don't, we aren't destroyed by our emotions. We're only destroyed by those emotions that we feel like really, really attached to and, and that become our overarching truth and, uh, and, and our whole self-definition. Okay, so that was number one. Your desires are not your boss. Number two, turn the spotlight in your mind towards a different direction. Sometimes we win not by fighting with our desires, but by focusing our attention elsewhere, allowing something else um, to 
something else that's completely different to take up the front and center space of our attention, the front and center space of our consciousness. Now, our ability to choose our behavior is part of our scientific design. Like we said, means that we could choose and it, we won't be able to do something that we did not choose. And sometimes that choice happens subconsciously. And for that, we need a lot of help from Hashem, which we're going to talk about in chapter three, because yeah, we choose, but that choice happens not consciously. But that ability to choose our behavior is a scientific principle. But the Baal Tanya now continues and says, all that is true for anything, but when we are striving to align with Hashem's truth, when we want to use the clarity of our mind to direct a behavior, to be aligned with Hashem's truth, we have an extra empowerment. There's something more that's on our side. And to describe this empowerment, the Baal Tanya quotes Shleimah HaMelech, who says, Vira'isi, and I saw, Shayesh, there's an advantage, there's a quality of wisdom over foolishness. Just like the advantage of light over darkness. Now, many times, those of you who are with us for a while, you know this already. When the Baal Tanya answers a question, the Baal Tanya often answers a question without actually writing explicitly or telling us explicitly what the question is. Here, the Baal Tanya writes, Perush, right? Afterwards, the Baal Tanya is going to write Perush, meaning there's an explanation. So we know that an explanation is coming, and we know that an explanation is needed. The unspoken question here is, which the Sepharim that explained the Tanya explained the question. What's the question? That usually when we use a mushal, whenever we use an analogy or a comparison, it's because the thing that we're trying to explain is complicated and it needs an analogy in order to be able to understand it. It's difficult to explain, so we need to compare it to something that we already understand. And now by applying that understanding to something else, we can understand it. For example, if you're trying to describe how hot it is outside, right? You could say it's as hot as 99 degrees, or you might say it's hot enough to fry an egg on the sidewalk. Now we know how hot it is because you didn't have words to describe it besides giving it a number or giving it a comparison to something. So here Shlem HaMelech is telling us something interesting. He's telling us that wisdom has an advantage over foolishness. What kind of advantage? It's like the advantage, the quality of light over darkness. Now, why do we need a muscle here? Why do we need this analogy? Why is this comparison needed? It's very simple to understand, even without a comparison, that wisdom has an advantage over foolishness. Of course, wisdom has an advantage over foolishness. Of course, wisdom is better than the opposite of wisdom, right? Why do we need a comparison here? That's the unspoken question that the Baal Tanya is now going to answer. And the answer he gives us is that Shlomo Malach is not telling us about the value of the light or about the difference in the quality between the light or the wisdom, because that's something we know already without the analogy. The, the Shleim HaMalch is giving us the compa comparison to illustrate the relationship between wisdom and foolishness. The relationship between wisdom and foolishness is very much like the relationship between light and darkness. It has, the relationship has the same advantage uh, the relationship between wisdom and, fo and, and, and foolishness has the same advantage that light has over darkness. Light has much more strength than darkness. Light, it, it, light has a relationship with darkness. Light always wins. Okay. In the Baal Tanya's words, let's going back into the text. Yisrael ushlita umem shala al uses three different words to describe the advantage of light over darkness. Just like light has superiority, dominant, dominant power and rulership over darkness, right? And we see this expressed in two ways. Number one, a little bit of light dispels, pushes away, cancels out a lot of the darkness. And number two, it does this process, the darkness gets pushed away on its own automatically without 
any fight, without any effort on our part. So too, the foolishness of klipa and sitra achra, the foolishness of ideas that contradict or deny or ignore, ignore Hashem's truth, get pushed away by the wisdom of the neshama. Our neshama has strength over our ego. Or let's put it this way. Hashem's truth has strength over Hashem's hiddenness. Our neshama has the strength over our, of our ego, but only in action, not in impulse and desire. Within our heart and our conscious minds, our impulses that ignore or reject Hashem's truth are very, very strong. Yet as soon as we take action on that level of behavior, the action directed by our neshama has the strength and impact of light over darkness. That's why to fight our inner impulses, to fight our negativity, to fight that sense of worthlessness, the shame, the ego, the, um, the, 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 all that otherness, the chaos, the confusion, the despair inside our hearts, we don't need to argue with ourselves. We could argue with ourselves, but that's not, there's, there's something else that we could do. We don't get anywhere by hating ourselves. What we really need to do is turn on the light, turn on, act on our neshama, put our neshama into our driver's seat, the driver's seat of our mind. Like always think, okay, so now if I let my neshama speak up, what's, the, what's my neshama's opinion about my worthlessness, okay? Or, or about my despair. So that's also an action. So when Valentine is saying action, it's not just limited to what we do in our bodies, it's also what we do in our minds. With that, when we turn on our neshama, when we put the neshama in the driver's seat of our behavior, we can master our behavior, including the behavior in our minds. Now, here, here's, here's, I wanna just bring this back to the beginning of what we were talking about before. When is foolishness dangerous? When is that ruach shtus dangerous? When is toxicity dangerous? When is emotional unhealthiness dangerous? The only time it's dangerous is when it doesn't look like foolishness. It look, when it presents itself as healthy and wise, that's when it's dangerous. Beliefs and behavior that deny or contradict Hashem, it's part of our system. They're not inherently dangerous. They're only dangerous when we see them as truth. Truth is powerful. Truth is so powerful. Truth is as powerful and impactful as light over darkness. And that's why the minute we turn on the light of truth, the battle is over. The minute we recognize that this idea is foolish, it's not the truth, this behavior is not is foolish, <clears throat> it's not aligned with my truth, the fight is over and we won. There, there, and it happened automatically without, without sweating over it. We don't get destroyed by our anxiety, by our depression, by our unhealthy habits, or our limiting beliefs. They're only, they're only harmful when we believe them. And this is the empowerment that we have when we strive to be a Bainini. We have an extra empowerment when we strive to be a Bainini. In addition to the scientific principle of Mayach Shalot Ahalei, we have an extra empowerment, a gift, and a blessing that Hashem gives each and every one of us. And that is that our neshama has the power of truth. It has the power of light over darkness. Our neshama versus our ego is like light over darkness. And as I was learning this, I was thinking, it's very nice to know this, but I don't experience it. And why don't we always experience this? And I, I, and I think it's because to me, you know, in my place of ego, I see my ego as the truth, right? We, we let our ego override our truth about Hashem. And we let our ego be our personal truth and above Hashem's truth. And so we act according to our ego and we engage in all kinds of unhealthy, destructive thoughts and behaviors. But the minute we act on our neshama, the minute we surrender to our neshama, when we let our neshama have that power of truth over our ego, there's no battle. We won, it's over, the, the fight is over and we are the winner. And that's true in the long term, in the bigger picture. And it's also true every single moment, every single behavior, every single day, 
every small battle, when we commit to aligning with Hashem, when we decide, I will never contradict, deny, or ignore Hashem in my life, right? I will never contradict the fact that I am a carrier of Hashem's light. I will be a carrier of Hashem's light and I will give that credence, give Hashem's light within me more meaning and more credence than anything else I believe about myself. That will be my overriding truth. This has an impact on our behavior in, in, in two tremendous ways. Okay, number one, the mind rules over the heart. Like we said before, so clarity in our mind creates a change in our behavior, right? But then there's something more because that would be, even if we made a commitment to always, let's say, you know, eat ice cream every day. I will never miss a day, right? So you will, you won't miss a day, okay? That's just a scientific pr principle. This, so, but there's something else. There's something else and this is, this is a gift. Truth completely cancels out lies. Wisdom cancels out foolishness, just like light cancels the darkness. Our neshama has the power to cancel out our ego. It, so when we act out on our neshama, even within a moment, every moment when we are acting on our neshama, we are automatically canceling in that space and in that, mo in that moment, we're canceling out our ego. We're giving our neshama much more strength and we are weakening our attachment to our ego. A few more lines before we conclude. If we have this question, you know, if the Bainani is so conscious of Hashem and absolutely committed and showing up in every behavior, every time, every day, aligned with Hashem, absolutely aligned with Hashem, why is he not called a tzaddik? And the Balatanya explains, because a Bainani is only conscious of Hashem when we switch on our consciousness. Our attachment with Hashem, our attachment with our neshama, our neshama itself is subconscious. It's hidden within us. We only experience the light of our neshama when we turn it on. And so that's why it's possible to be in a state of unconsciousness. And when we could be, we could be, we could lose consciousness to the point that the foolishness of our ego, that part of us that could deny, ignore, reject, contradict Hashem's truth, right, could be so alive and take up so much space. It could drive us. It could pull us. It could trigger us. It could, when we're not consciously turning on our neshama, our ego, and its desires are turned on. We get triggered, we get pulled, and all kinds of thoughts pop into our minds. And I think it's very helpful to know this because we should never judge ourselves for having these thoughts. We will, so many times, I hear this from so many people, but why does this happen? Why am I still dealing with this after so many years of personal work? Why am I still dealing with the net? Why, do I st why does my mind even go there? And the answer is because that's how Hashem wired us. And every time we make that choice, to turn on the light of our neshama, to act in alignment with Hashem, we are bringing Hashem's presence more into our hearts, into our minds, into the world, and we're bringing the world closer to Geula. So there's a purpose. It's not for nothing. But we will feel, it's as if we didn't, relative to the fact that, you know, when I davened, it was impossible for me to even consider contradicting or denying Hashem's presence. And now I do feel these thoughts my, 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 my worthlessness does, does come up in my heart and in my mind, right? But still, the Baal Tanya says, one thing that won't happen is, We still won't uh, consider actually doing it. We might entertain the thoughts, you know, we might feel hungry on Yom Kippur, but we're not going to, and we'll be aware of that hunger, but we're not going to go eat, okay? Um, and one other thing that's, we'll conclude with this line, there are um, feelings and tendencies and, and, and leanings and that, that, um, that emotional invitation to do an Avera, 
which the Gemara says is actually worse than an Avera because it's more impactful and it's more lasting. It takes up more space. Don't, don't worry. Even a Benini will have those thoughts, um, the temptation, the ugly thoughts, the thoughts that we're not proud of, that we don't want, the, 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 the tendencies, the desires, emotional, psychological, all that stuff, um, whether it's worthlessness, whether it's despair, whether it's self-pity, whether it's hate or resentment or anger or temptation, whatever it is, it could come up in our mind. It can get in our way. It can disturb us from our service of Hashem, from our Torah and Aveda. This is something that Chazal tell us that these three things, a person is never, we're never free of them completely. We're never, we're never speared these things. That's Hera Avera, um, the temptation to do an Avera, Iyun Tfila, concentrating on our Tfila. And the first, the, the third thing that Chazal tell us, which the Baal Tanya does not include here, is Avak Loshan Hara, because the Baal Tanya is talking more about what takes place in our minds. And Avak Loshan Hara is not in that category. Hera Avera and Iyun Tfila are both in the category of our mind, and that's why Baal Tanya quotes them. So never judge yourself for having ugly um, shameful, something that you consider shameful or undesired temptations or leanings or tendencies, that's something that we are never speared from. We have to focus on our choices, on our behaviors, um, which, which we have absolute, we have, you know, we're there, we have absolute possibility. Okay, so let's open to discussion questions. It's an excellent question. What do we do about the fact that, how do we make peace? with the fact that in the past, we didn't have this light. You know, we lived, we were in the darkness. We didn't have the awareness and the consciousness that we do now. Did I get the question correctly? I think that that's the, toxic, that's the paradox of choice, where on one hand, Hashem gives us the power of choice and, and we have to hold that power of choice with reverence and know that we really have the choice to be conscious in this moment. And at the same time, Bitachai means that whatever happened in my life until now is exactly the way Hashem wanted it to happen. And we could never mess up Hashem's plan. I think the part of me that thinks that had I done differently, the outcome would have been different is, is the same part of me. That's my ego. You know, I could have controlled it. I could have done better. I, I should have done better. The Baal Tanya famously said, Voltich Zoltich is apicarsis. You know, to say that I could have, I would have, I should have is, is denying Hashem's truth because you could not have. How do I know for sure that I could not have done any differently? How do I know that absolutely sure that I could not have done differently? Because the fact is I did not. And if I did not, I could not have because Hashem, Hashem created the reality. Now that doesn't liberate us from the responsibility to do teshuva. It doesn't liberate us from the responsibility to learn from our mistakes. But maybe, you know, maybe, you know, we're, we're coming to this Monday is Pesach Sheni. And the message of Pesach Sheni is that it's never too late. In the, in the words of the Rebbe Rayat, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, he used to say about Pesach Sheni that the message is, Azes is nishtak hain farfalin. You know, there's no such thing as a farfalin means like it's over, it's done with, it's too late, right? It doesn't translate well into Yiddish. It says, farfalin. there's nothing that's impossible to fix. And the question is, what do you mean? I can't fix yesterday. I can't, it happened already. I can't bring back that moment. And, and the answer is that the energy of regret, when it's, when it's, when it's shame, it keeps us locked in a vicious cycle of disempowerment and ego and stuckness. And just, it makes us feel weak and it takes away from the power of now it takes away from the power that we have to choose right now when it's shame, but when it's just guilt, when it's regret, Oh, I wish I would have done that differently. You know, I wish I, I, I could have, I regret, you know, I regret not having that, that insight that I have now. 
you know what? Take that energy and let it make a difference to somebody today. I could have never appreciated the value of my worthiness if I didn't get stuck in worthlessness. Me personally, I wouldn't be teaching these ideas if I didn't know the darkness. And knowing the darkness, if you ask me if I want to do it again, no, I don't want to do it again. Could I fix all the results of my inner darkness? Absolutely not. I'm still dealing with the impact of that till this very day. Because each of us is, is, is we, we're, we're, we're connected to other people. And sometimes we make mistakes that have a lifelong impact on other people, especially if we're mothers, right? So, and especially if we're teachers, especially if we're good friends, you know, especially we, we, we have close relationships. Anybody who's in our life is going to be impacted by our choices. So there's, there's, there's work to do in, in repairing that. But to me, I look at it like this is what the way I make peace with my past is that I really, you know, really try to remember that Hashem, Hashem designed it this way. It could not have been any differently. And, um, and my, the goodness that's coming out of, you know, my darkness, it might not be helping that specific moment in time. There's a different goodness. We don't know Hashem's workings. We don't know Hashem's plan. We don't know Hashem's design, but we know that it is good. And there is a design and there is a plan and it is good. And, 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 um, and if we take that energy, that also can reinforce our peace. If we have peace, we could take the energy. And if we have energy, it gives us more peace with our past. That was a beautiful question. Um, just thank you again for joining today. It's such a blessing to be back in Tanya. And um, I really look forward to being together next week. Um, I just want to say one other thing. We're having on this coming Monday, God willing, we're having a group meet, a, a Zoom for group leaders or for people who want to start a group discussion, or if you want to um, have a chavrusa that can help you, like a, a learning partner to go through the book with it. The Zoom is going to be, we're going to have a few different people who already run groups, who are already group leaders, talk about their experiences as group leaders and what works and what doesn't work. We have some really, really good presenters and I'm very excited about it. So that's happening on this Monday, um, one o'clock in the afternoon, New York time. That's 10 o'clock in the morning in California and um, sometime in the evening in England. I'm look, really looking forward to that. And then we'll see each other again on Wednesday.